Hi everyone, this is Max. I'm here with the European Time Zone Meetup Group, and we're going to do a collaborative close reading of W.B. Yeats's The Second Coming. Not an American poet or an American poem, but one that's about a, say, modern experience that I think would resonate with lots of American poets um, back 100 years ago and today. So here we are, the second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loose and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body in the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So, you know, <laughs> light, light reading material on a Saturday afternoon. Um, does everybody have the poem in front of them? Does anybody need a, need a link? All good? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I just realized I could have posted that link. So this is um, uh, Yeats's probably, I'm just going to guess, most famous, most anthologized poem um, uh, written in the immediate aftermath of World War I, um, picking up some themes that the war had made uh, really apparent about life in the 20th century and what uh, life in the 20th century promised for, for people in um, you know, the so-called modern world. Uh, it was going to be one of, of uh, chaos, disarray, and, and violence. And that's um, what uh, Yeats is, is writing about here, this, this feeling after the war of being, not necessarily of, of being relieved that the war is over, but feeling like society is on a precipice and things are just gonna get worse. Um, and he wasn't entirely wrong, uh, to say the least. But that's a pretty common theme in a lot of, um, uh, I would say the high modernism out of out of um, England and Ireland that we're all that, that some folks might be familiar with this this sort of sense of of, of uh, looming chaos or disorder um, that's a big theme of T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, it's something that lots of that, that novelists like Virginia Woolf and James Joyce responded to. It's, uh, it's something that we don't see as much of in the American poetry that we discuss from the same time period in Modpo, which is, um, let's say around this time, we have folks like the objectivists or, or, or no, rather the imagists, I'm sorry, um, who are a little bit more interested in aesthetic questions and don't seem as preoccupied with um, these historical, like world historical problems that uh, they were somewhat inured from living in the US and being so far away from the conflict that claimed the lives of many um, uh, people in Europe, uh, especially young men. So let's, I don't know, what can we do with this poem? I think there's, <laughs> there's so much to, to do. Uh, I kind of gave the historical synopsis, um, but I think that it's about a lot more than what I just said to <laughs> uh, The second coming, I mean, what's the, let's just start with the title, which I think is always a good place to start. Anybody have any ideas? It, it's obviously has a biblical connotation, but I mean, is there anything else it could mean? Yeah, Anna. 
Well, first of all, I guess uh, the second coming could also be um, like pointing towards uh, the definition of the second world war. So um, maybe coming is just another word or just something that um, is closing this gap between the war and the now. And um, maybe the second coming might also mean something like hope. So if there was a first thing, maybe there will come something better, but maybe also something worse. Right. I, th I think I think that that speaks to how um, the the poem feels very prophetic, right? If we think of it as as being as being written in this historical interwar juncture, uh, Jenny. I was just thinking that this is relevant to the fact that Yeats was Anglo-Irish, and at this time the the start of what is still going on of the various troubles between the Catholics and the Protestants in Ireland was taking place. And so for him, this time was in a way more serious than it was for most of the rest of us because of, because of him being Irish. Mm. And um, he was a Protestant. Um, going back to the biblical bit, but he was also a spiritualist. So his Protestantism disappeared and he was a spiritualist. And so this second coming is quite complicated, I think. Sure. And to some extent possibly comes out of his wife's automatic writing, which makes it even more complicated. So, so you, you've introduced some, some um, biographical information here. Can you say a little bit more about the automatic writing um, uh, practices that, that he and his wife were getting into? Well, I don't understand it completely, um, except that they, that they belong to quite an obscure private spiritualist kind of a group. Um, and I, I don't know enough about the detail. Uh, so I think I can't say anything very, very useful about how it happens, except that it's supposed to come, you sit down and what you write isn't what you're proposing to write. It's what's, what comes through you. Right. Um, so so I, I, can, I can elaborate a little bit on that, but, but, but uh, can, you, can you unpack what, his Irish identity would have meant for for his engagement with the First World War as a as a poetic or political subject. Well, I think it would be complicated because he spent part of his childhood in England. I just dived into the biographical stuff because it seems so relevant to the poem. Oh, sure. Um, sure. I, I, the First World War, it would be quite complicated in a sense because as, as an Anglo-Irish person, I don't know whether he was, I mean, he didn't fight in the war, did he? So I don't believe he did, no. I don't think he did. So I don't think he was called up, uh, possibly because, but I don't know, because he lived in Northern Ireland. I don't know. I, I can't, I'm, I'm only seeing him kind of sitting in this place, which is different from sitting in England and different, say, from Joyce sitting in Dublin. Um, that sitting in Northern Ireland is quite a difficult place in a way, because at that time the British ruled Ireland from Northern Ireland, uh, which was not terribly popular with a lot of Irish people, particularly in the South and particularly oh. Catholics. And remained unpopular for, for many decades, even in- Well, the and <laughs> remains a problem today. It remains so, a problem today. Um, yeah. It hasn't gone away, it simply changed. Uh, they're not shooting each other at the moment. That doesn't guarantee they won't. That's, that, that, is, that is some progress on that. <laughs> um, Caroline and then Jeroen. Yeah, I, I was just going to say yeah, that the First World War is very complicated for the Irish um, because sure. um, um, they're, at the time they are a colony, they are run by the British North and South. Um, and so they're, they're kind of the mixed feelings on the part of the Irish. And I don't know... I, don't know what Yeats's view of the conflict was, but I, I know there were people in the South in the Republic who signed up um, to fight, but there were also people who signed up to fight 
because that meant the British would give them guns. And so they they went off. Um, so they, you know, and then came back and then you have the Irish Civil War. Um, but relevant to this poem, I think the other element is um, the Easter Rising of 1916, which had just been put down by the British yeah. in recent memory when Yeats is writing this poem as well. Sure. It's a, um, it's a chaotic moment. Uh, it was a chaotic couple of years in, well, I mean, in Europe, obviously, but, it, you know, there are these, these um, domestic issues happening in Ireland as well, right? Um, with yeah with the uprisings and um I, I i so i posted i i linked to this poem an irish airman foresees his death by yeats which is a sonnet um a sort of world war one sonnet and begins to to kind of um point us to, to to a little bit more to the problem of of being irish in world war one which is as you were uh saying carolyn it was um uh I, irish young irish men were being called upon to fight, you know, the, the, the English war, right, basically. So um, it was quite unpopular and led to things like uprisings, and it was actually a very galvanizing moment for the for the nationalist movement um, or, or the Republican movement. Um, Yeroon? Yeah, um, coming back to his uh, his other beliefs with his, with uh, and the automatic writing of it with his wife, that was the point that I got, got completely lost in yesterday and this morning. Um, uh, he was a member of the Golden Dawn, and then uh, when that uh, spiritual uh, weird uh, <laughs> stuff uh, broke up, he, he got into uh, one of the, 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 the offshoots of, of that, and that's, uh, that's um, kind of a ceremonial magic stuff that was quite common around 1900, and it had this very deep link with um, the Egyptian, uh, old uh, Egyptian gods and everything. So, what I was, what I was found fascinating is that um, he clearly talks about the Sphinx uh, as the thing that is the second coming, and. Um, this is from 1990, and, and uh, the last uh, he 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 only um, he left uh, the the Golden Dawn offshoot in 21, and he and he had this book A Vision that came out in 25 with his wife uh, about his automatic writing and all this this um, uh, self realization that 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 came with it, and yet somehow uh, in this poem. Um, the the sphinx is kind of maybe it's it's almost devilish right it's it's um uh, very much contrasted with uh, the uh, the first coming of christ and it it really made me wonder the second coming is is uh, is that the coming um of something evil um where the first coming was uh, christ or is it um the second time something bad comes, or uh, is the Sphinx uh, something bad? I, 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 I really do not know. The more I thought about it, the more confused I got. And that's this, this is very consistent with the, the point that Anna started on uh, yeah. beginning here, which is we're, you know, the title alone, Second Coming, doesn't indicate whether what's coming is good or bad, right? Only oh, yeah. some sort of return. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what you're saying here, Yeroon, I think is is very um, is 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 consistent with that. And this this occult sphinx-like creature that he goes on to describe in the in the second stanza, which we're meant to understand is the second coming, it has no doesn't really seem to have too much um, any specific moral value attached to it. Mm -hmm. Don't know. It's it's quite it's it's a somewhat terrifying. Image right it's 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 walking through the desert uh these desert birds are reeling around it it's slouching towards bethlehem to be born which is this absolutely terrifying line but but is it you know is it is it the um is it a new kind of occult 
uh, or, or, or let's say pantheistic or, or non-Christian spiritual substitute that's come to, to replace Christianity? Uh, or is it, is it something more like an antichrist, right? Like, like, I, I mean, and I mean, obviously in either way it would be the antichrist, but is it, is it an antichrist, like, you know, like a demonic antichrist? Um, is it a bad thing that's coming? Uh, Mary? Well, you know, from the Christian Bible, Matthew, well, the King James edition, and he's, uh, he warns it's going to be uh, a little bit, you better be ready because it's going to be like the flood. And in the 37, he said, but as the day of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. And this idea of the Son of Man was related to Christ coming another time. But before that, there will be a terrible disaster, like the flood. And he goes on to elaborate, oh, when two people are, are eating and drinking, when other people are in the field, and all of a sudden this horrible flood will come along. So it could be related to uh, the second coming of the Son of Man, which would be Christ, or the second coming of a thing like a flood, a catastrophe. And it's kind of, if you read the whole, I won't read the whole thing, but he said in, in the 44, verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so I think he's also related to this, Christ, this Christian version of, of the Bible. And I, I think that's what people expected during the first uh, several years after Christ died. And they expected some, some miracle of good to come, a good Christ. But what Matthew insists on here is something terrible could come. Right. And that's um uh go ahead mark i just like yes I, I agree completely on on mary um our opening question was uh what do we make with the title um the second coming it's it's biblical and yet it isn't biblical um it starts in the way the uh the revelation is written there are many allusions to to the revelation and the revelation also has these peak pictures um these terrifying pictures what what will come Turning and turning in the wilding guard, the, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Uh, what a strange image. It alludes uh, to, to, to Shakespeare, to, to the Renaissance. I cannot remember that um, falcons are important in, in the Bible. Uh, what, what comes to, to my mind is uh, Petruchio of uh, The Taming of the Shrew, mm -hmm. who tries to control the world. And um, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. There's, there's no control. Things fall apart. And then in the second stanza, um, Yetz goes back to, to the revelation. He alludes to the revelation, and everybody expects that he is talking about the Messiah, the, the Lord, um, Jesus. But then he comes up with, where is it, uh, the, the beast? And what rough beast? It's our come round at, at last. So um, it isn't the Lord who comes, and it isn't the second coming that everybody expects and yet he gets back to to bethlehem which is again a clear allusion back to to jesus christ the lord right uh, uh, go ahead kurt yeah um i was interested in that also um maybe it relates to what you're saying i'm interested in the the, the, the line falconer cannot hear the falcon cannot hear the falconer uh partly because uh, one little general thing I have is when you talk about animals, I think it's very interesting to actually study them. And mm -hmm. then you you may know more about what the poet is talking about. Often we say, well, let's just dig in and try and see what he's saying. But if you actually say, I, I've had a little experience with a falconer. And the, the interesting thing about a falcon is that um, it's not like you're the person who tells the falcon what to do. You actually motivate him with food. Um, they When you send a falcon out, he has to be... Um, uh, he has to be hungry enough to know that he's got to come back to you. They say if you put the falcon out and he's eaten, and they can tell by touching the, the sternum, see how fat they are, they'll just go away. So, but I was curious about it is that the falcon cannot hear the falconer is almost a, a um, we're almost, lament, there's some sort of lament there as though it's a sign of chaos. But strangely, it means that someone is no longer dominant. And 
it, to speak to Mark, uh, the concept of Lord, strangely enough, we you think, oh, he's religious. He's using the word Lord. But what does it mean? It means your boss. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there's a little bit of irony in that, uh, quite a lot, in fact, that maybe, uh, you know, we, we both want that the Lord to be somewhat good for us, but maybe he's also our boss. And so we do need a revolution. So in that dichotomy, perhaps we see uh, also the, the problems of the second coming, whether it's good or bad. It's, that, that's an interesting falconing context. Uh, <laughs> Kurt, I, 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 was, I was not aware of these, the, the intricacies of, of, of falconing um, other than, so since you're our, our resident expert, uh, falconers they're the ones with the gloves and they put the little hoods on the falcons right and then and then you when you remove the hood that's when he flies off or or she flies off the falcon and, and, and the the, hood, they use strangely, the hood, right like i I've, I, I don't know the hood i find interesting excuse me uh, i'm sorry it, because it actually calms them they they say there's too much sensory stimulation for them and they'll be just too anxious so they're actually happy to have the hood on because they're just saying, oh, I don't want to see this stuff. This is too much going on. Because you think about their eyes and how sharp they are. Yeah. They're just seeing everything around them. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry, uh, I missed what your question was, though I interrupted. No, no, uh, no, I, I, think, I think you began to answer it. Oh, oh no, they, they use falcons to hunt. I mean, falconers, you're, you send out your falcon to go like hunt like squirrels or something? Yes. Okay, or, or mice or, or rodents, some small mammals. Foxes. Can... They get foxes too, in Mongolia. Jeez, oh, okay. <laughs> That's a uh, foxes seem kind of big to me, but I guess there are small foxes too. Um, Mary, did you did you have did you want to weigh in here on the question of falcons? It's wonderful. It's interesting because yeah. when he says the falcon cannot hear, I had the impression it's called like entropy. It's going around and yeah. around and around till it does fall apart, and the falcon gets so far out, it can't relate to the to the falconer. And the falconer can't relate to it. It's just entropy. It's you know? right, right, and it, it's, it's like, like turning and turning and turning until until everything falls apart. It's it's a it's a sense of entropy before before we have the the term entropy. Um, uh, Susanna. Yeah, I, I love this image of the widening uh, gyre that it's getting larger and larger and then the center cannot hold. So the farther away you get from the center, the less stable it is. And the center that has been holding everything together cannot hold it anymore. And I'm finding it very interesting what's going on in the whole stanza because this one we can understand, but the following gets further, further away from our understanding. It needs more interpretation. Mm -hmm. For instance, the ceremony of innocence is drawn, something that's very complex and very hard to understand. And um, so the pro progress in this, this stanza is that we, we need to work harder to understand what he really means, whereas the image is very clear in the beginning. And I would like to, to work on that a little bit as well, you know, what's happening here. There's a few things that are very obscure, like the blood dim tide is loosened in this, uh, the drowning. Of course, you have, you have I think it moves further away into a, um, um, a realm of emotion where you, you have a flowing, something that happens with the liquids that he's, he's talking about, blood in tides and, and then the drowning. And then he ends with passionate intensity. So that's, that's, that's the feeling realm that I mean. First you start with a visual image and then you get into something that we, we experience. That's, that's how I see that, that stanza. It's, there's a really good reading of the kind of motion of the poem and I wanna, I wanna, um, I know Christian, you wanted to, to weigh in, so I'll yes. turn to you. Well, <clears throat> the sentence that really spoke to me, that really clicked, it was the, is moving with slow thighs. And I just went into the Fisher King that's wounded at the thighs. And then it totally changed <clears throat> the whole thing, like he's in the desert because the Fisher King, like nothing can close around him. And he's slouching toward Bethlehem because the Fisher King needs the chosen one and Bethlehem is where the chosen one is. So that's like, I didn't see the beast, you know, in the desert as the second coming, but as the wounded 
that needed the second coming and he was largely the way with the end. So, so the rough, so, so the, the Sphinx creature is, is not the, the, um, the, the, the second coming, the antichrist. It, it's the, it's, it's a sort of symbol of, of the society that, that he's describing in the first stanza, right? Where, where the ceremony of innocence is drowned and the blood is, is pouring and, and all these horrible things. Society, the whole world, the, 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 all the men, you know, that are, is so wounded that it's slouched into a Bethlehem and Bethlehem yeah. is where the healing is. Right, right. So going back to, to the source, um, that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting interpretation. And I, we're going to go to Stanley and then Jenny, and then uh, I'm going to ask some pointed questions about specific <laughs> the poem based on everything that everybody's been saying. So we've got to generate a lot of material here, but go ahead, Stanley. Well, this, my handy dandy dictionary here, because I just looked up the word gyre and it's it's like, you know, just to turn and whatever. But the very next word is called the gyre falcon with a picture of this really plump falcon. And I could see what Kurt was talking about. <laughs> if they're if they're plump, they're not going to come back with, with your food or whatever. What's, what's the definition shows, of the gyre falcon? Yeah, he's, he's a he's a large falcon in the northern hemisphere, but but he's oh. just really plump. And I could see Kurt touching his. You said you've actually done that, right? You've been a falconer. Wow. I just just one day I went with someone who showed us well, how. One, how it one day is more than one day is more than most of us. Yeah. But, <laughs> but this this falcon, he, he's he's just really plump and i and i can see that you want to you know slim him down a bit to be a good hunter but <laughs> but the first two lines of this of this poem by the way my wife and i have been arguing for a few days is it poem or poem because she likes to do haikus and she when she puts the poem into it you know she gets two <laughs> syllables um anyway so turning and turning in a widening gyre, it's like the the whole world is exploding and the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Well, do they hear the falconer anyway? That's, Kurt? The, the, that's, the, that, that's what Kurt was suggesting, the fact that that's not part of falconing. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, sound is a part of the process. So ah. um, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's what what I I probably said uh, when uh, when I said that the falconer controls the, the falcon. So the falcon hears um, the the falconer. Um, the falcon is controlled by the falconer. And uh, just to to add what Stanley said, I'm so um, impressed by by the first two lines. Um, the, the audacity that is behind that. You, you can hear um, the, the turning and turning in the widening gyre. And uh, yeah, it loses control, like um, the, the falconer who cannot control um, the falcon anymore. He has no control over the verse. You have this enchantment. It goes on in the next line. And then he comes to the conclusion, things fall apart, even the poem falls apart. You do not have a rhyme scheme. You do, uh, uh, I didn't check, uh, do you have meter here? No idea, but um, it, it goes more into prose and yet he puts that in a in a kind of, of poetry. I think the first two lines, they are the best of the whole poem. I, so, yeah. so Mark, you've started to, to bring us into the formal reading, which let's, I'm gonna hold on to that for a second. Let's go to Jenny first. Since Jenny, I think you have something to, to add <laughs> a moment ago. Well, I've got two connected things, really. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary definition of gyre is spiral or vortex. And in a sense, I'm looking at the contrast between the vortex of the first stanza and the, which would be the literati thinking, if you like, and the traditional thinking of the second stanza where there's nothing new, things come round and round and round again. And the second stanza made me think of Shelley's Ozymandias right. with this um, sands of the desert and moving its slow fires. It made me think of the two vast and trunkless legs of stone standing in the desert. And then when Jeroen talked about um, 
Yates being interested in Egypt, that suddenly made sense because Ozymandias was about Ramesses II, who was a very powerful pharaoh in the 13th century BC in Egypt. So there's a kind of sense, and the poem itself is about the transience of life. So that makes me think about the second stanza. Surely some revelation is at hand. Well, it may be, and it'll just be another revelation in the sense that, that everything comes and everything goes in the sense that it does with Ozymandias, that 13 centuries ago, there was this very powerful king that none of us would ever have heard about if Shelley hadn't written that poem. And if you hadn't gone to school where I was, you might necessarily have not necessarily have ever met the poem. That's um, the, the Ozymandias, uh, the reference to Ozymandias is, is a, or the comparison is, is an apt one. I, I, I posted it here in the chat. Um, and I, I think that that sort of speaks to the same, to, to the historical moment that, that um, Yeats feels himself to, to be in. I mean, Shelley's poem is kind of about how uh, a once great, as you were beginning to say, a once great civilization can, can turn to dust and sand and be lost, right? And so that's sort of the, 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 the that's the experience of the, this romantic poet in the, in the Shelley poem where he's walking through and he's like, he's like, oh, that's crazy. There was a big statue here once of this king and now it's all wrecked and ruined and there's nothing here. Um, uh, but this is, so, so there's, there's something similar happening with, with, with Yeats where he feels like he's, he's similarly at this peak of civilization where, where uh, you know, Western civilization is saying, you know, like Ozymandias does in the Shelley poem, you know, look upon my works in despair, like that we are, this is modernity, we are, we are uh, driving bravely into the future, not realizing that it's actually on the precipice of its own, its own destruction. Um, uh, I, so, so I wanted to, to start to, to, to follow Mark's lead and take us into a formal analysis of the poem and, and I want to do that by maybe dwelling first on the just also, okay first on the, the the first part of the poem the the shorter first part and then moving back into the second part so we've started to we, we started to to generate a lot of 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 information about um you know relevant to both parts of of this poem we're talking a bit about falconing uh, we're talking a bit about some of the historical context that that might um, that might start to explain what the blood dimmed tide is. Um, and then we also, we've started to, to bounce around some different ideas about what's happening in the second part, whether this, you know, where, where this monster is coming from, I don't know if it's monster, where, wherever this, this Sphinx thing is coming from, if it's, um, if it's a, a good omen, is it a bad omen? Um, is it, uh, is it the second coming itself, or as Christian was suggesting, is it actually, um, is it, is it the part of the, is it a, a sort of, uh, personification of the wounded society that he's describing in the first part of the poem? So, so we've got a lot of, 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 you know, we've got a lot of different avenues to pursue here, but I do want us to like stay with the first part and, and talk about the, this, this, this entropy and Susanna, you started to do that as well. Um, Kind of talking about how right off the bat the poem seems to be like uh the, the terms of the poem seem to be widening the if the poem is a falcon it seems to be also eluding yates the falconer right um maybe maybe not though maybe uh maybe it's actually not <laughs> that simple maybe we can't quite graft that that sort of meta reading on here um, so he says things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And Mark, you start to say that this is that this is in fact like a kind of meta moment in the poem, right? Where it's it's like things are falling apart. There's no there's no clear rhyme scheme. It's not really it's not it's it's a like, it's not like perfectly blank verse either. But but is it really like a chaotic poem formally? Um, or is it is it tighter than one would think? So so another way of, of approaching this is 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 to go back to this thing about the automatic writing that Jenny suggested at the very beginning, 
Uh, so, so yeah, Yates was, and you know, part of this kind of like a cult group where they were getting into some like pretty heady stuff where they were just like, with or without the help of opium, were like just writing stuff uh, out that came to their minds, right? Like this, this, this kind of like, you know, a hundred years ago, that was that was pretty out there, um, uh, especially in the circles that he would have moved through. Uh, but here, you know, this isn't like an automatically written poem. Like it's 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 not it's not full of like like non sequiturs and, and strange like associations. It actually kind of holds together. Um, so so yeah, let's 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 maybe like talk a little bit about the the form. Suzanne, do you wanna you wanna start? Yeah, I just the the moment um, I like your reading that it's that the falcon can't. Um, hold um, the falcon and he can't hold the poem because when it gets um, to that point where we don't really understand it anymore he stops the stanza and then he starts something new so that's a formal a big formal thing and the stanzas are not balanced the first one is shorter than the other one so stanza was not anything they had in mind in the beginning so he has to end it there and there's this gap between the stanzas and we can look at that what it means and, and then he, uh, what is very interesting in the second stanza that, um, that he repeats the second coming and he says, hardly are those words out. So that is automatic writing for me, that, that he lets it come out and then he reflects on it. And, and he finds, and then it evokes this huge image. And with the words, the image comes and then he writes about the image. Mm, so that that's is... also a formal consideration that he reflect, reflects on his own writing. That's 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 a good reading. There's there's something um, about the process that's that's here in the poem. Um, uh, Mark and then Yeru. What what I said before was that the line uh, isn't uh, line stopped. It, you, you have the the enchantment. It right. it goes on. Um, it's such a wonderful beginning, and I'm sure that Yeats would have been able to to write proper lines that really stop at, at the end of the verse, but, but he doesn't. He has this uh, enchantment and things really fall apart. Then, uh, and, and he loses control. The first stanza consists of eight lines. Could it be an octave? Could it be part of a sonnet? Hey, probably he was writing or tried to, to write a sonnet and then he lost control. And when he came to, to assess that, mm -hmm. he wrote more lines. Have you counted how many lines the second stanza has? 14 lines. He starts again. He, um, and this is probably also a second coming, the second coming of uh, his attempt to, to write a sonnet. <laughs> Things fall apart. Nice. So it's an aborted sonnet followed by like a written sonnet. So 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 you you're, lines, yeah. you're so, so you're actually like you're elaborating Susanna's uh, sort of processual meta reading where there's there's um, we can read in the in the poem some traces of its own creation, right? That it's like. Like yes, actually, and, and actually, after the octave, uh, we would expect a volta. There must be a break, and there is this blank line. And what I would expect is that um, the success that comes, but it's a new sonnet, new attempt. And and so this right, the second section is fourteen, so it is it is um, mm -hmm. a sonnet. I'm trying to like. Can I gloss it real quick? Yes, it only has 14 lines. Uh, do 14 lines make a sonnet a sonnet? Uh, sometimes. Your <laughs> um, uh, room? Yeah, um, what I was thinking for um, um, about the automatic writing, um, when you look at uh, surely the second coming is at hand, this second coming with uh, this exclamation mark like it, it, it's, it's a revelation, but you can also think of it uh, because it has, uh, it's um, repeated with an exclamation mark is a kind of a passionate intensity, what's, uh, which is the last line of the first stanza. Um, so in, um, in that sense, he, he knew what was coming. <laughs> in my idea so it's, it's right. not completely uh, uh uh that he had the first eight lines and then started again and didn't know what, what was what was happening um the second thing about 
let's say the formal aspect is in the, the, the first stanza is very much about um, the, the winding chaos, which, which reminds me of the, the uh, let's say the, the world ocean of the, the when we uh, the, the, the old mythological flat earth with this this horrible ocean around it. And then in the second stanza, we go right at the to the center, which is the desert, the Egyptian desert, which is the center of this widening gyre. Uh, it, it's the center that could not hold, which means it goes to Bethlehem mm. because it doesn't stay in the middle. So uh, we, you get this this water ocean in the first stanza and in this this desert dry thing in the second stanza it's, that's an interesting ecological reading here <laughs> of, the two, of the two sorts of environments present in each i had never even thought of that yeah there's there's the flood of the first and the desert of the second um anna do you want to do you want to add something yeah uh first of all i really love the interpretation of the sonnet because i haven't thought of that um, but to me, the poem kind of holds together um, because I realized that there are a lot of parallel sentences and there are anathos a lot, um, mostly in the first stanza. So um, he uses those stylistic devices uh, to show that the poem is kind of something whole. And um, it is kind of a prognosis to me. It's not like, um, well, this is this already happened. Um, it's like this will happen. So um, maybe he does not try to imitate um, the things that are going to be sometimes. Um, he just wants to make a prognosis. And um, this is why the poem is written in something whole, something that belongs together and not something that falls apart. Um, Kurt and then Nunia. I just had a small point um, on the first a stanza, uh, we talk about it gyring out. But you know, this the last two lines are sort of a chiasmus. And I wonder whether that's sort of a culmination of the gyring out, because the chiasmus is very interesting. It's almost as though it's saying things are upside down. The best lack all condition, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. So you feel like it's turning out and there's a <laughs> upside down. I was wondering whether uh, anybody... yeah the, the, the chiasmus is sort of inversion of terms is is is, is interesting um go ahead Yuya. um yes i wanted to come back to the meter for a second um because i really like the the thoughts about if this like the if the stanzas really belong together or if they show, are rather separated and i think the same thing with the like the crushing down and the crumbling that we see in the um poem itself with the apocalyptic um, prognosis and stuff I think we see that in the meter as well with the blank verse because it's not just like the poem doesn't have a meter at all it has the blank verse but it sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't and I feel this mm. um, kind of shows the deterioration of the world in a way um, that sometimes you can see um, where maybe where the reason is and sometimes you have a revelation and sometimes you don't and I think um, that meter kind of ties it together as well like two stanzas. Hmm. So, so this the the you're sort of understanding the the um see the, the, almost like the fluctuations in the meter or the sort of unevenness of what right. of what we see as a blank verse as, as being almost like it's kind of playing with this 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 chaos that that the poem is trying to to understand, right? Or or, or this this actual it's it's the poem's really like this dynamic between chaos and order. Uh, yeah. So so there's something like that. That's yeah. That's 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 cool because it does really seem like a blank verse. Um, I, I kind of want to uh, go back to the to the to what Anna was saying about about the poem being. Uh, you, um, you know, a sort of prognosis to, to, to try to think about where the, um, you know, where is Yeats here? Like, where is the speaker? Um, and is that important for our understanding? And what is he, um, he you know, what, what does he want us to actually take away from, from, this, from this poem? Uh, Anna, do you want to go ahead and, and jump right in since, since this was your yeah. line of thought? 
Um, I think that the speaker himself is maybe still turning. So um, he sees that there is something coming, but he doesn't know what. So maybe he is right in the first uh, verse of the whole poem and the rest is just what he sees, but what hasn't come yet. So he um, describes the future and he is in the present. Okay, so he's, so he's looking, right, and, and then that fits with like revelation and, and the vast images troubling the site, these almost like prophetic visions of, of the future. And of course, with the idea of, of coming, right, of something arriving. Um, so, so he's, he's, he's attempting some sort of analysis of the, of, or, or some, some sort of predictive thing of the future and can't quite, um, grasp it though, right? Like, is that, he's not really sure what the future holds, is that correct? So is he perhaps trying to create this sense of, of unease as well in, in the reader, perhaps with all of the various like uneasy formal things we've been tracking, like what Unio was saying about the um, the the verse, you know, as uh, we're reading it now today, a hundred years later. But I imagine folks who were reading this in in nineteen twenty would you know would be looking at this and being like, this is blank verse. Oh, it's not really blank verse, and perhaps being almost more unsettled by that, especially if they were trained to read poetry a certain way. I think you know a hundred years later, where we can have a different sort of, of, of understanding of that, but perhaps that the, 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 the ambiguity of, of the meter and the form would have been more unsettling in readers uh, in the past and would have gone towards producing this kind of uneasy effect that's fitting with, with the poet's own unease about what's coming. Um, and I think there's also other, other formal devices like the chiasmus that Kurt was talking about where, where there's this inversion of terms that's also sort of confusing, right? Like, like the best are this, the worst are this, the worst are the best, um, you know, all these, these things that are, that are uh, you know, meant to make us feel uneasy and confused. Um, Stanley, do you have something to, to throw in here? Yeah, well, I just was really drawn to the, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And that's that's what I, I really feel like this whole, the first verse anyway, is is like how chaotic World War I was for the whole of, of Europe. And then the rough beast slouching into Bethlehem. <laughs> that, I mean, to be born, you know, if, if, if Jesus is actually coming back to Bethlehem to be born, um, and he's slouching. He's not, he's not even excited to come to this planet at all. You know, it's like darkness. But that the ceremony of innocence is drowned. I, I think that is a real key to the, the poem for me. The ceremony of innocence is, is drowned. Yeah, the, the loss of innocence, right? And, and feeling it here in 1919 more than ever before. Um, your own? Could I just... I'm oh. sorry, just quickie. Maybe the ceremony of innocence is drowned refers to baptism because it's a baby um, drowned and then there's water involved. So it's, it's like going too far somehow with your just a little suggestion. Sure. And that brings us back to the kind of ecological <laughs> readings, right? What, what body of water is this? Is this a flood? Is this, <laughs> is this a basin of holy water? Is this a, let, let's, let's go ahead to, to Yarun and then we'll go to Jenny and then we'll start to, 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 call the falcon back in on this one. Uh, I wanted to elaborate on something uh, Anna said, because um, she said uh, the first stanza is right, uh, the, the, the here and now of the poem, and the second stanza is somewhat uh, uh, prophetic. But what is interesting is that uh, the only time uh, Yeats is actually in the poem is um, uh, when you see uh, now I know and um, uh, troubles my sight, it's in the second stanza. So he really tries to be the uh, the prophet here. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I, I thought that was interesting. But he's a. Uh, I mean, is he okay with being a prophet? Is uh, he's a bit overwhelmed, I guess. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Not knowing. We, I think we yeah, can kind of... What we talked about earlier about the, the ambiguity of, of uh, 
and the prophecy uh, yeah which, which is uh, closer to the automatic writing when you don't you don't have the control so it's uh, it, it's uh, something big well it, it's come comes out of the spiritus mundi which is of, uh, the, the spirit of the world with it's bigger than he is so he doesn't he doesn't have to understand to see but we also I, I think that this is you know this is this is what's also so like unsettling about this poem is that these various um trying trying to trying to be prophetic trying to use these 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 strategies that we know um you know biographically like automatic writing and and uh, these occult things that he was into um the uh you know even even just the writing of, of poetry right as as if we want to follow Susanna's analysis and, and think of 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 him being like being like okay second coming like oh wow that means all these things and here I'm writing it into a poem right all of these, these various strategies he has to try to foretell uh anything mm -hmm. are fraught and don't seem to bring him too much comfort <laughs> at all um so it always begs the question like what are you what are you doing like why why are you uh why 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 are you doing this um jenny do you want to go ahead and, and um it? yes it connects a bit to, to what your has just said um but i just want to go back to the first stanza we haven't looked at those two words mere anarchy no, no. which are in the middle of the first stanza and in a sense relate to what he's describing in the first stanza uh, that's just mere anarchy. And in the second stanza, in a sense, he's going for complete anarchy. And this is one possibility of the horrible things that might be coming that are even worse than what we've got at the moment. Um, but the other thing I wanted to look at was Yeats's definition of Spiritus Mundi, which is a universal memory and a muse of sorts that provides inspiration to the poet or writer. Uh right 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 right. so this is this is part of his uh, so that yeah so that's yates's that's yates's description of what right. spiritus mundi means the world the world spirit right right Which, it's a world spirit but it's also a universal memory and a muse that provides inspiration to poets and writers it's um the, the, the these these aspects of of the poem are often as we since we're here nearing the end of our collaborative close reading and we're only now talking about what the heck Spiritus Mundi would be. Um, these are aspects of the poem that are frequently overlooked, uh, which I find quite interesting. And it's a poem that gets, um, so very famously, the last line has, uh, you know, lends, uh, lends itself to the title of Joan Didion's first collection of essays uh, published in the late 1960s, early late 1960s, um, slouching towards Bethlehem. And uh, it's also the title of the title essay that Joan Didion wrote in 1967 um, about what was happening with the counterculture movement in San Francisco. And, oh, thanks for <laughs> slashing towards Bethlehem. So, so, um, so Joan Didion was, you know, her whole thing in, in 1967 is to look at the hippie movement and rather than, than um, either like sort of make fun of it, like people were doing the mainstream or herald it as some kind of like, oh, really great like peace and love movement. She sees it as the sign of, 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 uh, of the center not holding of like, of anarchy being, you know, loosed upon the US and not because she was like anti-hippie necessarily, but because she saw it as a symptom of like a greater crisis that was, that was taking place. And that's, this is like 50 years after uh, Yates. Right, mm -hmm. so so you know this feeling is continuing throughout the 20th century, and I swear, like in the last like 10 years, there have been so many things that have been like slouching towards Washington or whatever. You know, these kinds of things in the U.S. where people are always like recycling these lines and and the, the kind of like you know apocalyptic, prophetic, uneasy associations that we have with this poem, recycling them into into kind of contemporary cultural commentary or or, or social or political commentary because of just how like bloody powerful they are. But at the same time, you know, in, in, in that we've, we've, we've always, you know, you know we, we overlook these, these, these stranger, more occult things like the Spiritus Mundi um, and, and, the, and what's actually kind of taking place here in, in this poem, which is, which is this, this, in some ways, this, this kind of like unsure attitude towards the ego, like, is he want 
Does he want to be overwhelmed by the spiritus mundi? Does he want the spiritus mundi to speak through him? Does he want to sort of dissolve into it? Does he want to be, you know, or is he trying to stop, is he trying to stop the, the, the tides? The, the, is he trying to recall the falconer? Like, it's not really clear. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the different, uh, the, the, you know, the, the different attitudes he has towards things like inspiration, like with the Spiritus Mundi, where, you know, where you're just telling us, Jenny, it's, it's this idea of, of like, you know, the, the world spirit, the collective memory, this kind of thing that, that, you know, is really anti-individual, anti-ego, something that you would sort of, that, that would overwhelm you, as you were saying, the room, like it's something that, that, that you, you lose yourself in. He seems to want to channel that, but at the same time, he seems really uneasy by like, by the, um, but by the social disorder that he's seeing around him. So it's it's really it's 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 not clear like where he stands with respect to what's happening. Um, uh, any like final thought on this, Susanna? Yeah, I have a, a thought. First of all, John Didion passed away very recently. I think last December. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the, uh, what I wanted to say is that there's a huge critique of Christianity in it. And that uh, comes to, to show in um, the 20th centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And that, that for him shows in his vision. And what I see in it is that Christianity has our view so, so profoundly over until his, um, loosening from the grip of viewing things in a certain way and and that that his own um, vision counts at this point and it's stronger than the you know the tuck between the falcon and the falconer the this this connection is lost and now man is on his own finding out and getting nightmares and realizing from the nightmares that there's a, a true um i guess opportunity for him to see things on his own and not being basically caught by this uh, <laughs> this myth of this that he is critiquing in this criticizing sure so I find strong. that's a strong um, I guess he needs to find out what that rough beast means for himself and he doesn't know it that's 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 exactly yeah that's 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 a really good way to, to start getting into the, the Christian critique that's happening. Uh, Anna? Yeah, and uh, also about the rough beast at the end. Um, I'm just thinking about um, that if you have read this poem in the past, so when you were at about his time, and then you read this poem, I guess you would have experienced something like fear while reading that, because it's more of a question. And um, I love what Suzanne said about it, that you can you cannot say what this rough beast is. You have to figure it out for your own. And um, it's just a question that mixes it up at the end. So what is this rough beast? And I guess it's like an open ending if you're reading a book and you have to imagine for yourself. And that's what I love about this poem. It's, um, it's this darkness and at the end, it's this fear you take with you out of this poem and you're thinking like, yeah, uh, maybe sometime there will be this rough beast and no one knows what it is, but for yourself, you can make it out. So there's there's almost this invitation to interpretation at the end. Yeah, that, that's... Um, uh... Yeah, which which is a, which is a, in some ways a very modernist um, gesture and is very I, I think very fitting with the the critique of Christianity where um, uh, there's less I, I suppose there's there's the Bible is interpreted but always in relation to the Bible it's it's a very like biblical interpretation is is not a sort of open interpretive practice it's one that's very much meant to try to make sense of the whole. Uh, Bible as some sort of like uh, um, authoritative ultimate text, whereas here you you know you have this rough beast and you're like, oh geez, God knows what it could be, um, but this is this is what's going to replace um, twenty centuries of Christianity is 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 this far more arcane, open to interpretation um, uh, uh, system of of belief 